Top-down games have a lot of potential for adding pseudo 3D, and I love when games do this. So this week I added bridges that you can walk over and under, as well as a roof that reveals the interior of a house, and fixed my tile set, which will save me hundreds of hours of work when building levels. Howdy, and welcome to Game Endeavor, where I post weekly devlogs for my game Zoe and the Cursed Streamer. I have always loved when 2D games implement a depth to them, such as crossing a bridge over an area that you previously explored. I wanted to add a bit of depth to my game as well, so this week I added a layering mechanic that will allow for this. To do this, there were a few things that I needed to consider, such as the layering transition, rendering, and collisions. I need this to work per entity, so I can't just toggle the bridge's collision or adjust its rendering layer. I started working on the rendering first because at the end of the day when I'm showcasing my progress, I don't need my Discord thinking that I'm a complete failure. And if I can do these devlogs up until now without adding collisions to my cliffs, then my bridges won't need them either. To transition between layers, I have a node that listens for character movement up and down the ramps. It has two areas, one for the top and one for the bottom. When a character exits either of these shapes, then their set layer method gets called, which will adjust things about them such as the rendering and collisions. This works for every character in the game, including enemies and pets, so they will be able to use the bridges as well. Handling the rendering is pretty straightforward. I'm just adjusting the Z index as I need to. If the player is standing on the ground, then they have a Z index of 0. If they move up the ramp, then they get a Z index of 10. The value of 10 is arbitrary just to give myself some breathing room between the layers, as I'll mention here shortly about the bridge. Godot's Y sort node is used to render other nodes in a way that you would expect for a top down game. Nodes with a lower Y position are drawn before nodes with a higher Y position. I mention this because the bridge gave me a bit of hassle getting it to render how I wanted it to. This sorting is based on the position of the node, which is why you may have noticed that I placed my character's feet at Y position of 0. I do this purely for sorting reasons. You're supposed to place the origin of your sprite where it touches the ground. The trouble with the bridge is that this is at multiple locations. There's the point where the front stakes touch the ground, but also where the rear stakes touch the ground. And there's actually each individual railing that touches the ground, but I don't intend to have anything on the other side of the railing, so I can actually just render these above and below the characters and use collisions to keep them from getting too close. The walkable part of the bridge as well, it can render under all of the characters on this layer, which I do by lowering its relative Z index by 1, actually putting it on layer 9. So there's at least two nodes that need sorting, the back stakes and the front stakes. The trouble is that for the nodes to sort, they need to be inside of a Y sort node. I tend to group everything together into a node 2D. I tried converting this to a Y sort node, but interestingly enough, the Y sort doesn't seem to consider its own layer when sorting. This actually gave me a bit of trouble, trying to figure out why my bridge wasn't sorting correctly when I tried giving Y sorts a specific Z index per layer. Instead, I'm probably going to have to set its children via code. It's only one bridge so far, so I've set this manually, but this is easily prone to breaking if I don't automate it. But since I can't use the Y sort this way, I'm instead reparenting the back railing so that it's within the Y sort node. I don't particularly like having to do this, especially since I need to do this for every complex node that has multiple ground locations, but for now this works. Also, if I ever need to remove the object, then I'll need to remember to remove the parented child as well. An issue that I recently discovered with this layering technique, however, is that if two characters are overlapping each other, then this messes up their Y sorting because the entity that is higher up in the layer now gets rendered over top of the lower entity. Unless you pretend that the skeletons are boosting each other over the cliff. So I'll need to find a way to get around this. I've known about this for really tall entities, like the tree which I have the top of rendering higher than everything else, but the solution won't work for the characters. Now for the fun part, managing the collisions. If you've used Godot, then you might be wondering how I disabled the collisions for these tiles specifically, allowing you to walk across the bridge. A tile map only has one collision layer for the entire tile map. It cannot be set individually for each tile. First, allow me to explain the collision layer system real quick. Earlier I mentioned that when a player runs up the ramp, they have a method that adjusts their Z index. Well, it also adjusts their collision layer while it's at it. In the inspector, Godot will allow you to assign the first 20 bits of your collision mask. But through the code, you can actually assign even more, so I'm using these extra bits for the layering system. If the player has layer 1 block enabled, then they can't pass collisions on that layer, but they can walk over or under it on a different layer. This is how the player is able to pass under the bridge, but they get stuck on it when they move up to its layer. With a layer block 0, the ground layer, this prevents them from walking onto the cliff from below, but allows them to cross onto the bridge from above. I still need to set the collision layer for these individual tiles, however, otherwise the player could just walk off of any cliff face. And this is where the hacks come in. If in my previous devlog you thought that my use of two tile sets for my structure walls was bad, then you might enjoy this, though I did fix the other one by the way, more on that in a bit. I'm actually using two tile maps here again, but before you get upset, know that it's handled automatically at runtime, so I don't have to manually do anything. 
In the engine itself, I built out the cliffs with one tile map, but there's also an empty tile map. Other than the missing tiles, this one is exactly like the other in every way. However, at runtime, I set their collision bits to be different from each other. The main one has its collision bit set for the layer that is on and the layer above it. This is so that the player collides with the cliff when walking into it from below, but also collides with the cliff from above to prevent them from walking over the edge. The empty tile map, however, only has one bit set for the bottom layer. This allows them to walk onto the bridge. The bridge scene has some areas on the ends. The purpose of these is for me to perform an intersect shape to get the tiles that are under this bridge. I then use that to unset these tiles so that the player can pass through them. And the tile set is set up to respond when this happens by setting the tiles on the now not so empty tile map. So the tiles get unset and then immediately replaced by the other tile set. This week I also added some minor quality of life improvements to my tile maps. In my previous devlog I mentioned how I had separated my structure walls into two different tile maps. This is because the top part of the wall acts like a typical auto tile, but the bottom part only needs to go along the bottoms of the tops which means that it's taller at some areas than it is at others, notably the horizontal walls versus the vertical walls. However, Reddit user Golda Asked Questions posted a link on my Reddit post about how they handle this with only one tile map. They do it by using a taller tile map than everything, but offsetting the texture and shape so that they overlap when placed. As you can see from my tile sheet, I can have the full wall sprites in here, but I only need a small piece for the vertical wall sprite because it gets offset and placed where it needs to be. This was a mind-blowing revelation for me. For some reason, I had never considered using a different size tile set than my tile map size. This is not even the best part though. This got me thinking, if I can use offsets and overlaps to fix this sort of issue, then I have another more painful issue that I really needed to fix, and that being my cliffs. Previously, I had been building cliffs by placing the tops of my cliffs first, and then going through and manually placing the bottoms. The trouble with this is that my cliffs are not flush with the tile set. I have a little extra space for placing the shadows underneath them. This means that the little elbow pieces where the cliff connects to itself needs to have the cliff sprite behind it. Trouble here is that depending on how much of a wide bend I've added to my cliff, this could actually vary by a lot. I actually created 12 different bend pieces to make these connections, and as you can see from this very painful video of me building out the town, it took a long time for me to place these cliffs. So long that I was seriously dreading building levels in the future. I thought it was going to be something that I would have to just force myself to do working through the pain and boredom. But the offsetting from the walls got me thinking. What if I were to offset my cliff textures horizontally so that they render underneath the side pieces? I can use the offset trick to scooch them into place, and it worked. After having implemented this, I am now able to build cliffs instantly with the click of a button. There was one small issue, however. Because of the grass shadow underneath the cliff, they rendered over top of the cliffs. So I had to separate these into another tile map and write a tool script that sets the shadow dynamically through the code underneath the cliff. But this is such a breakthrough for the game. I actually enjoy building cliffs now and want to use them everywhere. I've always thought the cliffs look really good in a top-down game, and so now I'm excited to be able to use them more going forward. A bonus from this is that I can also overlay the cliffs on top of other cliffs, giving them even more depth. I wanted to do this for a previous devlog, but with the other way of making the cliffs, it would have been way too much of a hassle to implement. And now, I get this feature for free. This is because the cliff tiles are actually taller than the tiles that they're using, so they're able to overlap the tiles behind them without messing them up. There are still some issues, however. For example, the ramps going up to the top of a cliff. Due to the padding on the base of the cliffs, they will overlap the ramp, which I have to fix by raising the z-index of the ramp so that they can render on top. This also means that I need to lower the z-index of the cliffs, otherwise the ramp will render over top of the player. The issue with this is the Y sorting that we mentioned before. It's now out of the question for the cliffs because they need to be on the same layer as the player. So the player will be unable to walk behind cliffs. I'm not too upset by this and maybe I can fix it somehow, but I was hoping to get a little bit more depth from this. In my previous devlog, I mentioned how I was going to be handling houses in the game. I want the player to feel immersed in the world, so instead of transitioning to a new scene when they enter a house, the houses will be built into the level and when the player enters, the roof will be removed to reveal the interior. I ran out of time last week to make a graphic for the roof, so I did it this week instead. I first drew a thatch roof for a more rustic feel, but after spending too long trying to make it look interesting and noisy, I gave up and settled for a shingled roof instead. I may still attempt to thatch again for a different roof option, but I prefer this look for now. Originally I was thinking of doing a retro inspired transition where the roof is pulled back from a single position gradually over time, but when I did this I wasn't too happy with the effect. After discussing it with my Discord, we decided to skip the fancy transition for now and go with a more basic fade. I would like to improve on it later, but it's not important enough for me to get hung up on the moment. I was a little sad though at having made the reveal shader and then not using it. 
but it still taught me something that could be useful in the future. I'm not experienced with shaders yet, so any shader knowledge will be a boon when I start using them to polish the game. This one in particular, it will be especially useful because it's able to find the world position for each vertex. I imagine I could use this to create my own lighting effect that has this retro feel but with a modern twist. I added a blackout over the interior to give it a little extra pizzazz, and this will slowly fade out when the roof does. This is achieved with the tile set so that I can draw it over the various shaped houses. It was a little tricky though because I needed this to go over the interior of the house, but also look like it's behind the walls. Trouble is, the walls are on the same Z index as the interior, just Y sorted. So I had to draw the tile set so that it looked like it was tucked underneath the lower walls, but it actually sits over top of the walls, just under the roof. I stream here every Tuesday, and this week we designed some enemies that may be used in the future. Ideally, I tried to design at least three things during each stream, but I ended up trying and failing to animate one of the enemies, which took up a bit of time. The two that we did design were a necromancer skeleton, and a dark spirit that wears a skull on his head. The big bad of the game is a necromancer, so expect to see a lot of skeleton and spirit based enemies whenever it relates to the main story questline. I found the necromancer skeleton to be an amusing one, because I don't think I've ever seen one in a game previously. The thought of a skeleton raising more skeletons hits that sweet spot for me. The other enemy is one that I've had in my head for quite some time, so it's nice to finally get it down into pixels and start the process for designing it. It's a ghastly spirit that quietly sulks about. I tried to make him look sad, which is a lot more difficult than I anticipated. It's also not meant to look blobby, but it's something I'll need to tweak when I sit down to work on it more in the future. Our Discord community is hosting a beginner-friendly casual game jam if you're interested. You can see the details here. It will start from August 30th, 2020 and run for a week. I will announce the theme at the start of the jam, and you're allowed to use anything that you legally have the license to. In our community, we tend to focus more on the game design and how great your game feels to play, rather than having to build everything else for it. If you join, then check out the notification roll to get tagged when the jam begins. There's a link in the description to the Discord, and I look forward to seeing you there.